looking today at uh, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. James raises the question, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we've titled this message today, Showing Wisdom, uh, because wisdom is obviously James's great theme in this passage. Uh, he mentions in verse 13, wise and understanding. 13 again, meekness of wisdom. Verse 15, wisdom that comes down from above. Verse 17, wisdom from above. So in six verses, we're given the word wisdom that many times. And the central idea, let me just kind of show you the map of this text. The central idea of this text is the imperative given in verse uh, 13. In verse 13, he wants you to do this, and then in verse 14, he says, but don't do that. Do this, don't do that. That's the map of this text. Everything else in this text is just why. So do what verse 13 says to do. Don't do the things that verse 14 says don't do. And everything else in the text is elaborating on that idea. So 13, 17, and 18 are giving us the do and the why of the do. And 14, 15, and 16 are giving us don't do this and here's why you don't do this. So let's jump into the text. Look at verse 1 with me. Or excuse me. Hey, Lewis, don't point at things you wrote and call them verses. Let's look at point one instead, because that would be better, and God will probably not strike me down. Point one. James wants his readers to possess and show God-given wisdom. Again, he wants his readers to possess and show wisdom. God-given wisdom. I'm drawing this from verse 13, where he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So James has a certain kind of wisdom in mind. And this is a wisdom that comes from the Lord. And he wants his, his readers to show that God-given wisdom. Now he has already op really opened his book with this idea back in James chapter 1 verse 5. One of the very first things he says to his readers is, If any of you lacks wisdom... Does anyone feel like they lack wisdom? Good news. James says, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So we talked when we studied that many, many weeks ago. What we studied was this idea that when you pray according to God's will, God is highly likely to answer that prayer, yeah? Does God want you to be wiser, or does he want you to be dumber? Which one do you think? probably wiser. If you pray for that wisdom, James says that's a prayer you can expect God to answer. And James knows that God is the source of this good wisdom. Uh, as we've pointed out many times before, uh, James has been heavily influenced by the book of Proverbs. I could make an argument that it's probably his favorite Old Testament book. And here in this text is the exact heart of of where he shows his love of the book of Proverbs. Now, 
remember, we've talked about this in, with Proverbs before, there's often a contrast made between how a wise man acts and how a fool acts. The fool in Proverbs is not a mental fool, right? We've said before, he's a moral fool. Okay? It's not that he can't process the information, it's just that he comes to the wrong conclusion and makes bad choices. He's not incapable of understanding these things, he just chooses poorly. And as you know, in this world there is a bad choices tax. Okay, the world takes the hunk out of you when you make bad choices. For James and for the book of Proverbs, wisdom is proved out in wise living, not in thinking profound things. Okay, because it's easy for us to picture a bunch of guys sitting around in a in a room smoking pipes and going hmm, and uh, just thinking, but what does it mean that you? park on a driveway and drive on a parkway, or whatever. That's not... The Proverbs would have no sense of this sort of an armchair philosopher wise man. The Proverbs want you to show that you're wise by how you make your choices. They want wisdom to be demonstrated, and that's what James is after. By Verse 13 again, By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Are you wise? Show it. And in your showing, let that showing be a showing that flows out of meekness or humility rather than boasting and flexing about how awesome you are. Again, remember, James knows the Pharisees very well. He's very familiar with wrong ways of showing your righteousness and bad ways of flexing to show how spiritual you are. And he wants you to stay far from that but he thinks, just like faith without works is dead, so wisdom without works is very, very questionable, too. He needs to see the fruit of wisdom in your life. Now, his big brother Jesus, in, in, during his earthly ministry, said in Matthew chapter 11, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. So John the Baptist was a certain kind of a weirdo, and his opponents said he was demonic. Jesus says about himself, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus says, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. My, uh, my cousin John didn't eat. He, he ate really weird food, didn't eat often. He was a desert ascetic kind of a guy. People thought he was crazy. I do eat normally. People think I'm a glutton and a drunkard. What do I do here? Jesus says, but it'll be proved out. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. If she is justified by her deeds. We'll see how it shakes out. So when James says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom, this means that wisdom that God has put inside you needs to be coming out. And you need to be full of it, so much so that it's leaking, <laughs> that it's, it's splashing over, it's, it's clear and it's obvious, and yet not in a way that is the pharisaical, hypocritical flexing. Rather, we demonstrate this meekness, we demonstrate these works in, he says, the meekness that comes from wisdom. If you have wisdom, one of the first things you should understand is you don't flex. You don't do that. You don't strut your spirituality because what you're showing is that you actually don't have that wisdom that you say you have. That's what you're doing in that moment. James wants his readers to show wisdom flowing out of humility. And in so doing, what ends up happening is instead of people looking at you and saying, what a great guy. They look at you and they say, what a great God. And that's the goal. Jesus, once again, in Matthew 5 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory, not to you, it says, but to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus himself says, there is a way of doing good works 
in front of people that people can see that causes them to not glorify you, but to look to the God who put that good stuff in you. And that's the goal. In fact, that's why God put that stuff in you. Not so you can be awesome and people can say you're awesome, but for the, the display of his glory that he, for some reason, has graciously chosen to involve you in. This is yet one more thing that he could do better without you than with you, but he graciously chooses and he has ordained that he will partially display his glory through his saints. Along similar lines, Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 19, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light. Now look at this little detail. I've, I've read this passage to you many times, but I've never highlighted this detail. Whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Once again, Jesus is, is advocating a public living that does display your good works, that does display your righteousness, but in such a way that the arrow, the neon arrow, points toward God rather than you. That's an excellent goal, amen? That's a fine target to aim at. So, that's what James wants. I've told you everything you need to know, really, to live out this passage. That's what he wants you to do. Go do that. We could be done, but you pay me for more than that, so let's keep going. James is going to also do a contrast between this heavenly, God-given wisdom and the wisdom of this world, or earthly wisdom. And so, number two in your notes, James is going to show what non-God-given wisdom looks like. Non-God-wisdom <laughs> looks like. I'm making stuff up, this is what I do. Non-God-given wisdom starting with verse 14. So after saying, show this wisdom in the meekness that comes from, uh, from wisdom, he says, verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. So, the contrast to this wisdom that is displayed in God-honoring humility is a heart full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And boy, I, the Lord showed me, sadly, the Lord showed me a lot about those concepts this week as I was studying. Bitter jealousy. Man, I thought about that a lot. What is bitter jealousy? You know what this is? This is when you can't stand it when someone else looks happier than you or when someone seems to be more successful than you. They're having a better day than you. You see, a, a good-hearted person says, man, that's great. <laughs> I'm so glad you're having an awesome day. You won the lottery? Fantastic news. You know, you, you, uh, you had a huge windfall in your life? Man, that's so great. Man, you crushed it in your solo today. You did so great. You're thrilled that this other person did so well and is having such a good day. But when there's bitter jealousy in your hearts, even if that's the stuff you said, what your heart was really saying was... Right? Is that about an accurate translation? Am I close? <laughs> Isn't that about right? It's, why, why didn't me? Why didn't I win the lottery? Honestly, because I never bought a ticket. That's why. But, why didn't I get this? Why, why are people like them better than me? Why are they having a good day? I'm not having a good day. It's, it's, it's that noise. That's the sound of our souls way too often when we see other human beings being happy. And that's vicious. Amen? What a wickedness that is. That person's happy, and that ticks me off. Mmm! If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, you see why these things go together. 
<laughs> selfish ambition. It should be me. I want to be the one. I want to be the star. I want to be the diva. I want to be assistant regional manager. I want to be whatever it is. I want to be that. Some of you saw what I did there. He says that this is coming from bad motives in your heart. Letter A. It springs from a heart full of selfish motives. Please keep in mind, church family, that who you are in your heart, that's the real you. Not your professional face, not your church face, not your social face. Who you are in this chasm, this dark place in your heart, your inner man, that's who you really are. And if we're not careful, this, this non-God-given wisdom can spring again from a heart full of selfish motives. He says in verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast. And in verse 16, he says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be these bad things, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Your motives are in your heart. If you say you're happy for that guy, but inside you're really <laughs> about it, God knows the real story. You may fool all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, blah, 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 and you will never fool the sovereign God of the universe, ever, who sees into your heart with perfect clarity, better clarity than you have as you look into your own heart. He knows. Boasting and jealousy and this kind of selfish ambition are rejections, James is going to tell us, of Christian truth. And I'll say more about that in point D in just a moment. See, here's the issue. You, in the center, that, that idea, you in the center, is the very core of your fallenness. That is the exact bullseye of what's wrong with you. Maybe I could shorten that up by saying, you are what's wrong with you. But specifically, this attitude of you in the center. Because, you see, you think you're, you're the star and role. This is your sitcom, and you're the main character. And everybody loves you. That's, that's, that's the show you want to be in. Everybody loves you. And it offends you sometimes when people love other people. It offends you when some other obviously just supporting character in what's clearly your story is having a good day or is getting extra camera time on them. And above all, it offends your sinful, wicked heart that God says you need to belong on the stage, much less in the middle of it. You in the center is the very core of your fallenness. And God in the center and on the throne is the cure for that. I have just mapped out the battle, the spiritual battle of the rest of your life. That's all it is. Will you be the center or will God be the center? That's the, that's the plot of your entire life story. Will this be about you or will you bow the knee and relinquish the false throne that you sit on over your own life and acknowledge that the king of the universe may actually be king of you as well? That's the idea. So, as James describes what this non-God-given wisdom looks like, he tells us it's, it comes from a heart full of selfish motives. Letter B, it comes from the fallen world and the devil. Again, it comes from the fallen world and the devil. This is straight from verse 15. Verse 15 says, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. So he's contrasting this with the heavenly God-given wisdom. He's saying, it's not that. He says, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's a strong thing to say. Earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Now, 
Some of you may be tempted. In fact, I can almost hear the gears grinding in people's heads right now thinking, well, that's kind of overkill. Demonic. No. Please understand. You need to understand how your enemy works and what he's up to. The devil... Now, in an, in an ideal world, which he does not have, he would love it if everybody would fall down and worship him, but that rarely is what happens. There are, there are few devil worshipers, and historically there, are, there have been few devil worshipers. That's his ideal, but since he often can't get that, here's what he goes for most of the time in my experience. The devil doesn't want you to think about him. He wants you to think about you. And you'll find yourself in his camp if you just do that. Again, he wants you to think about you. If you remember the fundamental human temptation from Genesis chapter 3, a big part of that temptation was the temptation to find wisdom in yourself and outside of God. Let me remind you of what the serpent says in Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, kind of, and you will be like God. Nope. Knowing good and evil. Kind of. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and look at this, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. You see, because the perfect holy relationship she was having with her, with her creator, that was not sufficient. She needed to be wise outside of him. You see that? tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So, James says that the mindset he's arguing against is actually a demonic mindset. And I'm going to double down on that and say so, and here's my argument for it. Please, because when you think of demonic you, what you're picturing is weird manifestations and horror movie stuff and people's heads, and you know, all that, and it just everything. You're thinking of that kind of stuff. And if you're not careful, the culture has taught you to equate the word demonic with kind of scary and kind of silly all at the same time. So I stand with James saying this. Our selfish self-centeredness is demonic. Stop thinking about the devil as a monster. Stop thinking about the devil as a boogeyman going muah, muah, like a cartoon villain. Stop thinking about him like that. He has sold you that image. Start thinking about the devil as a clever, conniving, cool, calculating, highly experienced lawyer in a business suit. And now you're closer to the truth. He's very smart. And he is very old. And he's been doing this business a very long time. And he's good at it. He doesn't, he doesn't accomplish what he does by running around in red pajamas with horns and a pitchfork. That, see, see, right? See what I just did there? It's comical, right? And that's the point. We don't take cartoons seriously, and we shouldn't. But we have a serious foe, right? And... If he's working so hard to make you that kind of selfish, you better believe there's a good reason why. And it is not for the goodness and the care of your soul. So this, this false wisdom comes from the fallen world and the devil. Let her see. It causes strife and wickedness. Verse 16, he says for... Uh, let me say that again because I just realized you don't have the screens. It causes strife is the word and wickedness. Verse 16 says, For where jealousy 
and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Funny thing, not everybody gets to be king at the same time. And that's the problem. Jealousy and ambition cause disorder. They have to. Because if someone else is happy and I'm not happy, i got to tear them down so I'll start feeling happy. Right? If someone else looks like they're more successful than me today, I need to kneecap them as quickly as possible. I need to come right up behind them and hit them in the back of the leg so they go down, so they're embarrassed at the big business meeting, so they're slandered at the water cooler or whatever. Someone else is having a good day. Well, that nonsense has got to stop. Jealousy and ambition break peace. Now, I can understand, and uh, I'm thinking about this, since James is writing in a church context, I've tried to largely apply this in a church context as I've thought about it. And I have observed that for humans to feel completely out of control is a very psychologically uncomfortable thing. And I have observed in my years in the ministry that it can lead to people grasping at control where they can get it. They, uh, they're not doing so great at work, but at home they, make the, they, they rule like a tyrant and make their wife and their children miserable because they want to be king of their little empire here. Or you have one or two biblically unqualified individuals or a certain family that's really running a church. Surely you know this phenomenon. It doesn't happen here, but it certainly has happened at churches you've been at in your life. Where there's one or two people who have not been passed through the elder qualifications, they have, they're not biblically qualified, they've never been officially installed, but they're the ones really running the church. Or a certain family name runs the church or something like that. This kind of stuff will always bring division. Because again, there can only be one king in the room. And while I'm busy being a tyrant, nothing is more offensive than a counter-tyrant popping up. That will not do. It causes strife between fellow humans, and the fact is it causes strife between us and God, because there is a king in the room. And you are just a rebel. It's not important that your little kingdom at your workplace is intact. It's not important that your little kingdom in the locker room is going well. It's not important that your little kingdom at the church is intact. None of that matters. Because you are not a king. Good doctrine guards us from all of this. When we've got the truth fixed in our heads correctly, we're safe from this error. God is sovereign over all, and you are just in his hands. Lastly, letter D. This sort of self-promoting behavior runs counter to the gospel. Again, it runs counter to the gospel. Going back to verse 14, James says, If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Now, the word the truth there, I think James probably means the gospel. Like, he means the gospel truth. The reason I say so is because of how else he uses this word in his book. In James 1.18, he says, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creation. I take that to be the gospel. Uh, James 5, verse 19. My brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I take that to be a gospel issue once again. So what I think James is saying here is if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, you are making claims that conflict with the gospel itself. Why? Because if you have bitter jealousy, that's based out of what you imagine you deserve. I should have that. I deserve that. You deserve jack. That's what you deserve. The one thing you do deserve, the Lord has graciously not given to you. 
and selfish ambition, how do we even talk about that in the kingdom of heaven? This is the disciples on the road in the presence of Jesus arguing about which of them is the greatest. It makes me twitch. How do gospel-saved, Christ-redeemed, grace-rescued people allow selfish ambition to exist in themselves? It's so counter to everything we know to be true of God's gracious story of how he's redeemed us. Amen? So, number three, James describes the characteristics of God-given wisdom. So he's told you what the bad wisdom looks like. Here's what the good wisdom looks like. He says in verse 17, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So once again, James is acknowledging that this wisdom comes from above in verse 17. It comes from from above. There's this great little bit from Daniel 2 that I'm so happy I discovered because I've missed this. I don't know, there's no telling how many times I've read Daniel, but you know how that is, right? You swear that just appeared in your Bible for the first time. This was my moment for that this week. Uh, this is after Daniel has prayed that God will give him the interpretation for, for something that's going on. And Daniel chapter 2, verse 20, Daniel answered and says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. How many times did he say wisdom there? Several. Where does it come from? God. Where does it not come from? Daniel. Who knows that? Daniel. <laughs> that could be the sermon right there. James describes this wisdom this way. Verse 17, the wisdom from above first is pure. You see, this earthly, demonic wisdom... If, if James used air quotes, that would have been the moment for it. That earthly demonic wisdom he was talking about before is everything but pure. In fact, it produces wickedness. But the stuff God's giving us stirs up purity and creates a hunger for purity in us. John says in 1 John 3, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he, Christ, is pure. When we are hoping in Christ and looking to Christ, that's supposed to move us to, in a trajectory of purity. So this wisdom is first pure, then peaceable, it says, uh, which is obviously the the opposite of that jealousy and that ambitious striving we've been discussing so much today. Peaceable is the opposite of that. It says it's gentle. Again, this is humble, not advocating for self, uh, not pushing yourself to the front all the time. Uh, it says uh, it's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason. Uh, another way we might say that in modern language is reasonable. And by that we mean able to be reasoned with not stubborn and locked up. Have you ever gotten between two people who are in conflict and they just can't move? They, they're, they're stuck. They, they, they get to a place where, no, I'm not budging. I'm not budging until he budges. Well, I'm not budging until he budges. And there we will sit for the next 40 years. This godly wisdom, the wisdom that comes from heaven, is reasonable. It's able to be reasoned with it releases some of that stubborn, no, I'm right and I will go down in flames to prove it idea. It goes on to say it's open to reason, it's full of mercy. Church family, those who have experienced grace should have a lot of it to give. Amen? Jesus Christ has poured out 
infinite grace on you for the infinite offenses you've committed against him, you probably have some grace to spare. Those who have experienced grace should have a lot of it to give. Otherwise, that's an act of vicious hypocrisy. I've been covered by grace, but I will hold you to account for every one of your minor crimes against me. Die, die, die. That's, what's, that's the script of our hearts way too often. The wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial. I'm not going to take the time to read out all this again, but I remind you of James chapter 2 where he urges his followers to show no partiality. Don't favor certain kinds of people over other kinds of people because of their social standing or their, their racial considerations or anything else like that. We are in Christ. And this partiality often comes from some sort of earthly ambition. And lastly, he says in verse 17, it's sincere, meaning, man, it's real. Probably not perfect. It doesn't. Unfortunately, God's wisdom has not yet produced perfection, perfection in me. But man, I'm trying. And God, in his grace, makes a lot of allowance for sincere, fumble-handed effort that we make. Praise God for that. And he says in verse 18, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This heavenly wisdom produces righteousness and it produces peace in us. And this just makes sense. The, the internal logic of this passage is amazing. I'm so glad I studied it. I learned so much this week from engaging with this passage and seeing James's structure and how everything ties together so well. Heavenly wisdom produces righteousness and peace. Because, see, it turns out, when we're not striving for control and when we're not furious that other people look more happy than us or more successful than us, or at least as happy and successful as we feel in that moment, then peace becomes possible. It becomes possible to live at peace with people. And where there's a peaceful environment, man, that's great ground for growing in righteousness. Which is harder when people are ticking you off all the time. Now that, that produces certain sorts of virtues, but it's, it's, it's hard ground to grow in. It's much easier to grow in grace when you're not mad at everybody all the time. Everyone isn't offending you, and it may not be all them. Maybe you're just very, very often sensitive, maybe is a word for that. Very, very sensitive, and you're just sure everybody's out to offend you, and so you go ahead and come into the room pre-offended and just wait for people to prove you right. Surely no one does that, right? I think James would like it if I closed from Proverbs, which is what I will do here. Proverbs 2, verse 1. The author of Proverbs says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight, and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures. So the author wants his son to seek wisdom like a precious thing, to pursue it with all of his heart, to do everything he can to gain wisdom. Verse four, or excuse me, verse five, he says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Man, this is an amazing map that you could just build the rest of your life around. Let me try to hit the main points of it. 
what he's saying is this. First of all, you should seek wisdom. You need it badly. It is a precious treasure, and you need to get digging to find it. He says, if you do seek that wisdom, you'll end up finding the Lord because he's the source of all wisdom. He's where it comes from. As you seek wisdom, you will find God right in the middle of that. The all-wise, all-knowing, perfect, omniscient God will be right at the middle of that. As you see him, you will begin to understand the fear of the Lord. And as you begin to fear the Lord, it's going to begin to change your life. He says he, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright shield of those who walk in integrity. Then you'll understand righteousness and justice and equity. You seek wisdom, you find God. Finding God makes you seek righteousness. All that stuff loops back around to seeking more wisdom, more of God, more righteousness, and this is the Christian life. All right here in this proverb. Wisdom and integrity, I need three hands for this, and the fear of God are all tied up in one another. Seek wisdom. Live in integrity. Fear God. Each of those props up the other ones. When you're doing one of them, you'll be better at the others. Are you seeing what I'm getting at? I need, I need to, again, I need a three-handed thing going on to make this clear to you. These things are all tied up in one another. God wants you to be wise. And guess what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this gracious truth we've seen from James 3 today. We pray for increasing wisdom in our own hearts. Lord, we pray for the opportunity to grow in grace, to grow in greater understanding of who you are, and especially how to apply what we've learned about you, God, into our lives through principles of wisdom. God, make us wise and understanding. Make us discerning and careful God, uh, I pray for my church family, especially this week, that uh, we will have time to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it won't be sucked away in Easter egg hunts and, and other distractions and candy and chocolate, but God, that our hearts will be focused to celebrate the magnificent victory of Christ over death and hell. Thank you, God. Prepare our hearts this week. We look forward to meeting again on Sunday to study the resurrection message. Christ's name we pray. Amen.